question, and in the next 35 to 40 minutes, he'll share with us some of his insights into the Raspberry Pi itself, what the board is, what it can do, and more importantly, how you can quickly begin programming it for yourself. He'll show us how to download and install an operating system onto an SD card, uh, start, up, start up the board and observe the boot up sequence, uh, how to use a text editor on, on the board, and show just how easy it is to begin creating and editing programs in a couple of different uh, computer languages. Evan, with over 2,800 people registered for this session uh, here today, we're delighted that you can join us. So over to you. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, uh, welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today uh, talking to you about Raspberry Pi, uh, which is something certainly I've uh, spent a lot of time working on myself recently. Um, I guess um, what I'd like to do today is just give you a little bit of an overview of uh, what the device is and what the device does, uh, and perhaps kind of take you through the first hour, maybe the first hour that you'd, uh, of things that you might do with a Raspberry Pi uh, when you take it out of the box. So I'm going to give you, start off with a little introduction to the device, um, going to show you what you get out of the box, uh, and take you on a quick tour of some of the physical features of the device. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, flashing an SD card. Now some of you may purchase a pre-installed SD card with an operating system on with your device. Uh, those of you who choose not to, uh, we'll need to provide an SD card, and I'll show you how you would go about taking an SD card image, an operating system image that you've downloaded from the Unlum 14 website, um, and uh, installing that onto your SD card from a PC um, so that you can you can get going. Um, take you through the uh, through the boot up sequence uh, and show you that we bundle a text editor with the device. Obviously, if you're going to do some programming, you need to be able to edit text. Um, so um, we would. Uh, Show you, show you the text editor that we bundle. I'll show you a Hello, uh, Hello World program um, in, um, uh, written in Python, which I guess is the language we expect a lot of people are, um, are going to use, uh, at least at first with the device. Um, take you through a slightly more complex example. And then to give you an idea of some of the media features that are on the device, we're going to show you a little OpenGL ES graphics program. The, uh, the device has a very powerful graphics accelerator. Um, and we'll show you a little uh, a little program which you can use to uh, which we bundle with every version of the, with every um, uh, operating system image that just gives you access to some of those multimedia features. Uh, finally, I'll talk about what we call the configuration file. Uh, this is a, this is a topic for slightly more advanced users. Um, this is a file that uh, you, uh, you can install on the SD card in order to give yourself more control both over the speed at which the device runs uh, and if you're using an HDMI display uh, over the resolution that the uh, uh, that the um, the machine uses when it communicates with your uh, uh, with your television. Okay, what is Raspberry Pi? So Raspberry Pi is something we've been working on in Cambridge for about six years. It's a um, uh, it's a small board um, uh, microcomputer that runs Linux, and we originally intended this to be uh, um, to be used in the educational uh, in the educational sector. This was intended to help us at the university in Cambridge attract more students into the uh, into our computer science program, but uh, as we've worked on this and as uh, news of this has spread, we've realized that there's an enormous hobbyist interest in this. Uh, and this, this, this is going to be some of the stuff I'll try and address today. As I say, we run um, uh, the GNU Linux um, operating system, uh, and we run this from an SD card. Uh, and we also provide um, some hardware interfacing features. I'm not going to dwell on those today, but we want, one of the nice things about the device is we do provide hardware interfacing features to allow you to do some very simple robotics Arduino-like applications. Uh, with, with the device. In terms of our feature set, got a quick summary here. Uh, we use a, uh, we have a 700 megahertz ARM 11 um, central processing unit. Uh, our GPU is what we call a video core 4 GPU. Uh, this provides us with kind of 1080, 1080p class um, graphics capabilities. You can see us as maybe being uh, somewhere between a um, uh, an Xbox One and an Xbox 360 in terms of our uh, uh, multimedia performance. Uh, we have a quarter of a gigabyte of um, low-power mobile memory, the ability to drive an analog or a digital television. And then for uh, to access peripherals, we have uh, USB. Um, well, we have two USB ports on our Model B device, or one on our Model A device. And on the Model B device, uh, we also have um, 
uh, fast Ethernet. We have 10 100 uh, um, Ethernet, and we draw our power from a mobile phone, from a mobile phone charger. Okay, unboxing first. So Raspberry Pi comes like this when you, could, when you take it out of the box. Uh, it's encased in an anti-static uh, in an anti-static bag. It's not a particularly static sensitive device, uh, but this is this is how they come to us from the uh, from the factory, and so this is how they'll come from us to you. Uh, taking it out of the bag, this is a Raspberry Pi. So this is exactly the size of a credit card. We use the we we use the uh, the spec for a credit card to uh, uh, to to design the board. Um, let's just take a quick tour around the outside. You can see in the middle there we have a central processing unit and RAM. And just hidden by an Ethernet connector, there we have a um, uh, we have a network chip. Uh, but all, almost all of the complexity on this device is in the connectors. So let's take a quick tour. So starting on the left, we have power. This is a, um, a micro USB um, uh, connector, which isn't designed to carry data. It's just designed to carry power. So this is just what you'd find on a modern mobile phone. And indeed, when I'm using this, I generally use my mobile phone charger to power the uh, to power the device. Next round, we have an HDMI uh, connector. You can use this to connect your Raspberry Pi either to a, an HDMI television, uh, in which case this will carry both uh, video and audio, uh, or you can use it uh, to connect to a DVI monitor uh, via an adapter, in which case it will typically only carry video. Next round, we have an Ethernet uh, connection. This is just ten, straightforward 10100 Ethernet if you wish to access the Internet. And then the next one, a pair of USB sockets, one, one stacked on top of the other. We expect that most people will plug a mouse and a keyboard into this. It's perfectly, uh, uh, it's, it's reasonably common also to plug, a, to plug a hub into this. People who wish to attach a, a USB mass storage device, such as a hard drive or USB key stick. Um, or people who want to add, a, say, a wireless network adapter or a second wired network adapter will typically add a hub here. Uh, next round is analog audio. This is a, uh, a three and a half mil um, stereo audio jack. Um, we provide broadly um, the FM radio, um, uh, FM radio quality uh, stereo audio. This is just an RCA jack. So people who aren't using a high definition television, we expect a lot of people using this device will use an old television they can find somewhere, maybe an old standard definition television. Um, and this is the uh, this is the connector that you would use to connect to that. Next round, we have a general purpose I.O. connector. So this is a 26 pin, uh, 0.1 inch uh, uh, pin strip. This gives us access to approximately eight um, general purpose input output lines, 1.8 volt input output lines, um, a, 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 a RS-232 um, uh, um, serial connection, um, uh, an I squared C connection, uh, an SPI connection, all of those are 1.8 volts, and a number of uh, number of power rails as well. These are not extreme. These are not particularly well buffered, uh, so these are connected directly to the central processing chip. Uh, normally, we expect that people would place some buffering and possibly level conversion between these pins and an actual external um, an actual external application. And finally, on the back of the board, uh, we have uh, an SD card slot. So you can't see that in this photograph. If I hold a Raspberry Pi up to the camera. You can see that here, that's this the front of the board. Okay, you can see on the back we have an SD card slot. You can see that this is substantially shallower than an SD card, so in practice an SD card will typically stick out of the device to about here. Let's zoom out one level. Um, you can see again in the middle here a Raspberry Pi. And these are all of the cables and accessories that we would typically use to configure it, with the exception of a mouse, which we won't be using because our examples here are all text mode examples. So on the left, you have a regular mobile phone charger. I believe that's a BlackBerry charger. Um, it is important to have a good quality power supply. Uh, obviously, you can obtain a, a power supply with your Raspberry Pi from Element 14 if you wish. Uh, it, it's, although it might appear that you can power your Raspberry Pi from a PC by using a USB cable, uh, we wouldn't advise that. Typically, um, the USB port, a USB port on a PC cannot source uh, quite enough current to supply a Raspberry Pi, um, and therefore you might expect when you put the Raspberry Pi under heavy load, um, it may not operate. It may not operate correctly. So, um, any um, any mobile phone charger which meets, meets the new European Union spec uh, for mobile phone chargers is sufficiently powerful to uh, power a Raspberry Pi. Uh, at the top, we have uh, just a regular HDMI cable. Um, 
uh, normal size HDMI at both ends. Uh, top right, we have an Ethernet cable. And then at the bottom, we have a USB keyboard. And in the middle, the Raspberry Pi uh, and an SD card. Okay, so this is this picture just shows everything plugged together. Raspberry Pi in the middle, all of those cables, I think with the exception of the network cable, all of those cables from the previous picture now plugged into the Raspberry Pi, and the SD card inserted into the device. As I said, you can see the SD card protrudes somewhat from the side of the device in, in normal operation. And then zooming out, here we have it plugged into a display. So we think probably five or ten minutes after you uh, um, have your Raspberry Pi uh, you've taken your Raspberry Pi out of the box or envelope you received it in, this is the sort of uh, thing you would see on your desk. So I mentioned before, it's possible to, um, uh, it's possible to purchase an SD card which is, uh, is pre-installed with the GNU Linux operating system we run. However, we expect many people will have an SD card that maybe they obtain a low capacity SD card, a two gig SD card that they obtained with a, um, uh, with a digital camera. Um, and so we, we're expecting a lot of people just to want to download their, their operating system and flash it onto the SD card. Uh, if you wish to do this, um, you will need to go to www.element14.com forward slash Raspberry Pi, and there you will be able to obtain two things. One, an image, uh, which is just a large dump of the data from an SD card, and also a tool which we call DD Removable. Uh, this is a tool which you can use to write that dump onto, a, um, on, onto an SD card using an SD card writer. Um, very straightforward process. Um, typically, get your two, to get your two gigabyte SD card, uh, insert it into your card reader, and then opening a command prompt in Windows, first of all, type dd removable minus minus list. Now what this will do, this will cause your computer to search for all of the um, uh, what, in, what, in, what Windows NT, what um, um, Windows XP and subsequent operating systems call block device objects, um, and, uh, and list, list, list them all out. And in particular, list which ones correspond to your hard drive uh, and which ones correspond to removable media. So what you'll typically find in that list, if you hunt down the list, you'll find as we do here. Let's next, let's zoom in on the uh, zoom in on the window a little bit. There we are. Um, what you'll see somewhere in there is um, a line which is marked removable media other than floppy, and that will typically be your SD card. Um, now, what you need to do there is look in the list and make a note of the um, of the the line in the list which corresponds to that. So, in this case, that would be backslash backslash question mark backslash device backslash hard disk one backslash partition zero. And uh, now, you're going to need this information in order to tell the DD removable tool which um, uh, operating uh, which um, which device to copy the operating system image onto. And then once you've done that, you can then type the next line. Um, and the important thing here, and I think you can see it on the, you can see, it, uh, you can see here what we've done is to copy that string that I mentioned, the device hard disk one partition zero. We've copied this into the line down here. Um, there was an arrow on the previous slide that shows that copy. If you, yeah, one of the nice things about this tool, if you attempt to, you don't have to worry too much, if you attempt to use this tool to write the image over the hard drive on your PC, which would happen, I, I think, in this case, if you were to type um, hard disk zero partition zero, um, then the, which is marked as being fixed hard disk media, um, this tool will detect that that's not removable media and prevent you from doing it. If you have another operating system, uh, if you have, uh, if you're using um, Mac OS, uh, or if you're using um, uh, Linux, uh, both of those tools, both of those operating systems, actually come with uh, a copy of the um, this this DD removable tool is actually a port of a native uh, Unix tool called DD. Uh, both those operating systems come with DD, and therefore, and you can use that uh, you can use that to to write the data. Certainly, I frequently use a um, uh, a Mac to uh, to write my uh, to write my cards. And here we are back again. See this arrow marks the uh, the copying the substitution of hard disk one into the uh, into the line. Okay, so assuming that that is completed correctly, uh, what you should be able to do is set the system up as you um, uh, as we sh as we saw on a previous slide. Uh, connect the power, connect to the display, um, and after a few seconds, when you apply power, immediately on applying power to the device, you should see the red power LED will come on. Uh, after about five seconds, uh, 
the green, there's a green LED adjacent to the red LED, that should come on and begin to flicker. And this indicates that the uh, system is loading data from the SD card. You should then see text appearing on the screen. And what you'll see there is the standard, uh, the standard Linux boot up sequence. So you'll see a Raspberry Pi logo in the top left hand corner, where some, sometimes if this was a regular Linux ins installation, you might see a picture of a penguin. Um, and the system will then scroll through. It will take some tens of seconds to uh, initialize the Linux kernel, load various device drivers, and get to a point where you can log in. At the login prompt, which should say Raspberry Pi login. See this on the, maybe on the next slide. Okay. Uh, so up at the top here, we have a typical login sequence. You'll see a line of text that says Raspberry Pi login. Uh, at this point, you can type the username Pi, uh, and then you can type the password, which is Raspberry. Um, obviously, when you're using this for yourself, you may wish to create a user, you may wish to create a user account for yourself uh, using the standard Unix tools. Um, uh, and you may wish to change the password on the Pi account if you want to prevent other people from, uh, uh, from from accessing your system. One last thing you may wish to do: you may wish to set the clock. Now, one of the um, uh, one of the economies that we made in order to hit the very aggressive price point that we, we're launching Raspberry Pi at is we haven't included a real-time clock in the system. Now, if you're connected to a network, if you can, if your system is connected to a network at startup. Um, it will go away and it will find, it will go to a network time server and it will find out what the current time is for you. Uh, if you're not connected to a network at boot up, um, then the first time you boot, it will, uh, it will pick a time which is typically far too far in the past. Um, on subsequent boot ups, what it will ensure it does is it will pick a time which is just after the time at which you last shut down the machine. So at least time will have the important property of continuing to move forward. You won't ever appear to jump backwards in time. But obviously, that time will be wrong. So you may wish to uh, set the clock uh, at your first or subsequent login without a network. If you do boot without a network and then you plug a network uh, cable into the device, then some tens of seconds after that, it will uh, it will go away and, uh, and and find the time for you. So you won't need to set it manually. Okay. Let's take a look at some. Let's take a look at a text editor. Now, the standard installation that you can download from Element14.com um, bundles the Joe text editor. Now, I think I believe Joe stands for Zone Editor. Um, this is a very simple program as a text editor. Uh, it dates back to the very early, very earliest days of um, uh, of Linux, um, but it's extremely powerful. And in particular, what it offers is what we call syntax highlighting uh, for both the Python and C languages. So. Um, a first session with Joe. Let's uh, let's write a program using Joe. So first of all, at the command line, you want to type Joe space hello world dot pi. So Joe is the name of the command you're going to run. Hello world dot pi is the name of the Python script you're going to edit. And then when the editor appears, like this, you can type print hello world in quotes. Now you see this. Uh, I mentioned syntax highlighting. Um, what's happened here is that the editor has detected the print as a keyword. First of all, it's detected that you're a Python program, so you can see at the top it says hello world.py brackets Python. So it's decided on the basis of the suffix, the file suffix, that this is a Python script. Um, and then knowing about knowing about the syntax of Python, it's detected that print is a, a keyword, shaded in white, and it's detected that hello world is a string, it's found the length of that string, and it's shaded it in a teal color. So you type print hello world, and now what you need to do is to save the file. Now, uh, the way you do this in Joe is you hold down Control, press K, release Control, and tap X. And that's the those are, those are the magic runes to save and exit in Joe. Now, uh, Joe has a very very large number of magic runes. Uh, you can get a lot of documentation about Joe at joe-editor.sourceforge.net. Uh, although. Um, I certainly found when I started using Joe that some of these things looked a bit intimidating. I also found that after two or three days of using Joe, I knew the 10 or 15 common sequences that I needed for programming, and it was no longer a problem for me. Okay. So we just wrote our first computer program on a Raspberry Pi. Um, what we've done is we've written a bit of Python, and then we've saved it into a file called helloworld.py, and that, uh, that file is in our home directory. So let's run it. So we can run this program using uh, the Python interpreter, which we bundle with the device. And the way you do that, just as previously, we typed Joe hello world.py to edit hello world.py. Now we can type Python hello world.py, 
and we'll um, load hello world.py into the Python interpreter um, and run it. So type Python hello world.py, and very quickly you'll see the text hello world will appear on, on the display. Um, a nice feature about Python is you can also run it in what we call interactive mode. Um, uh, so rather than writing a script in a text editor and then loading the interpreter and loading the file into the interpreter, we can just run the interpreter on its own and start typing into the interpreter. So if you were to just type Python at the command line, then you would get a prompt. After a few seconds, you would get a prompt. Um, and you could just type print hello world at Py. Uh, sorry, print hello world at the... Um, uh, at the console, and it would print hello world. And you can use this to experiment with virtually every function of Python. Uh, there are some great tutorials online. Um, there are already um, a guy called Liam Fraser has already produced a, a fantastic series of video tutorials. Uh, even though we didn't get him a, a, a Raspberry Pi until very recently, um, he's produced a fantastic series of video tutorials on YouTube. And you can, using your copy of uh, Python and Raspberry Pi, you can work your way through any any online Python tutorial. Um, Interactive mode is a great way to get used to the language. There we are. Hello world. Okay. Um, obviously, that's usually the first program that anyone writes in a programming language. Uh, it's also probably the simplest. It's worth seeing some more complex examples. One of the lovely things about Python is it is possible to it is possible to hack on a Python program without really understanding everything about the language. So what we've done is we've prepared for you a, uh, a bundle of slightly more complicated Python programs, which build up to an implementation of the game uh, Snake. We thought, given Python is our programming language, we thought that Snake would be an appropriate choice for, uh, for a game to teach you to write. Um, so we've created a bundle of programs. Uh, we've put them uh, on the raspberrypi.org website. Uh, and you can download them onto your Raspberry Pi. If you've turned your Raspberry Pi on, connected it to the Ethernet, um, then all you have to do is you just have to type wget this is a command line utility which will go and do a web, a web request. So just wget http raspberrypi.org forward slash game.tar.gz. What that will do is that will go and establish a network connection to the raspberrypi.org server, uh, and it will download um, a bundle of Python programs, uh, what we call a tarball, so that's a compressed archive of files onto your machine, typically into your home directory if that's where you still are. And then what you can do is you can type tar, xvfz game.tar.gz and that will then unpack that uh, that package now the, the magic runes here xvfz um, x means extract v means verbose so it'll tell you what it's doing f means you're going to specify a file in this case game.tar.gz and z reminds tar that uh, this is a, a compressed file rather than an uncompressed file um, when you've done that what you'll find is you have five or six programs uh, which take you through the uh, uh, very simple five-line programs that just take you through the, uh, the, the fundamentals of the Python language. So in this case, um, variables, arithmetic, uh, if statements, so conditional operations, looping statements, so that's iteration, um, and functions. Uh, and in addition to those five files, there are also about another five files which take you through writing Snake. So we start with a very simple program, which just allows you to use the... Uh, Cursor keys to move a uh, to move a, a character around the screen, and then gradually we build up. And those those are in a directory called a subdirectory called game, um, and those files are called game zero through game four, and snake.py. Let's a quick look at that. Here's um, uh, a screenshot of Joe uh, looking at some uh, look, looking at some uh, the first few lines of this snake.py. It's reasonably it's a it's a it's a reasonably short program. It's about 100 to 200 lines of code. Uh, it has a number of functions. Uh, what you can see here is a, uh, a function for adding a number to the screen, for printing a number on the screen somewhere where you can go pick it up with the snake. And down the bottom, you can see uh, the beginning of a function which adds an obstacle to the screen. So what I'd, what I'd encourage you to do, download this, download and unpack these files, have a little browse through them, run them, make sure they run properly, um, and then just try changing things. Uh, very, very simple things. Change the color of the snake. Uh, change the obstacle that's on the display, change how the snake's tail looks, uh, things like that. Um, I would say by the time you understand this program, this is a this is a um, uh, this is a, a fairly short program. By the time you understand this program, you're going to understand a very large amount um, about Python. There we go. That's what it looks like when you actually run the game.
Okay, so the Raspberry Pi device um, contains an extremely powerful graphics accelerator. Um, so this, uh, as I said, is uh, somewhere in the region of uh, maybe an original Xbox is worth a 3D performance. We also have the ability to play 1080p Blu-ray quality uh, video. Um, and generally, when you want to access those facilities, you, act, you probably won't tend to access those. You can access them from Python. But you'll typically try and access those from the C programming language. Now, where Python is an interpreted programming language, so the, the flow is you edit the um, uh, you edit your program, and then you launch the Python interpreter by typing Python and then the name of your program, and your program is directly interpreted. Um, uh, C is a compiled language, and therefore the flow there is uh, again you use a text editor like Joe to write your program, and then what you will do is you will compile your program. Using um, using a C compiler uh, to get yourself an executable, a native uh, machine language executable, which you'll then run on the device. So we bundle a number of examples uh, on the standard SD card image. Um, these are written in C. Um, they can be found in the directory forward slash opt forward slash vc forward slash source forward slash hello pi. And what we're going to look at briefly here is called hello triangle, and this is one of the simplest possible open GLES applications. So to run this example, uh, you need to do three things. First, you need to change the current directory to that directory using the cd command. Then you need to build the application using the make command, and that should then generate you a machine language executable called hello triangle.bin, which you then execute by typing dot forward slash hello triangle.bin. Again, as with the Python example, um, I, would, uh, I would suggest that once you have it running, you try editing it using uh, the Joe editor. Um, in general, uh, I think it is, uh, while you can often hack on a Python uh, program without understanding the Python program, uh, I think it's a little bit harder to do that in C, but I think you'll learn a lot by trying to do it. So here we go. Here is um, a small section of the uh, triangle.c uh, file, uh, again, in, in the Joe editor. This is, in fact, the bit that does the hard work. There's a, a substantial amount more in this program. Uh, but this is the bit that does the hard work, and what this is doing is making open GLES calls uh, to draw a series of um, uh, to draw a series of polygons onto the display. Okay, we have a range of uh, let me see, let's look a little bit more closely. Okay, here we are. So I mentioned there are three there are three steps that you have to take, um, and this is just a screenshot immediately after taking those three uh, those three steps. Uh, those are changing directory using the cd command then typing make to build it, and you'll then see uh, a number of lines here, which are the output of the C compiler and linker as it produces that, uh, that program for you. And then the final line uh, runs this hello triangle application. What you'll see when you do that on the display, it's a spinning cube. It's not quite the simplest possible OpenGLES application, but it's uh, certainly a good, uh, it's a good contender. And the various GL calls that you saw in that C program, um, the, the various GL calls you saw in that, uh, uh, that C program are at six blocks of GL calls, and each block of GL calls draws one of the faces of this cube. Uh, there are already a number of much more complicated examples. Uh, this is something like the Hello World program for OpenGL. Uh, there are a series of much more complicated examples available online. I guess the one that you might want to take a look at if you already have some experience with C or you already have some experience with OpenGL um, is a port of Quake 3. So we took the open source Quake 3 um, game and we've ported it onto the um, uh, we've put it onto Raspberry Pi. Uh, you can find this. We have a what, what is called a Git repository of the source. Um, this is available at GitHub.com forward slash Raspberry Pi forward slash Quake three. Um, if you look on GitHub.com under Raspberry Pi, you also see a number of other interesting things, including a tool chain that you can use to cross compile um, uh, prog programs uh, on a PC on a Linux PC to run on Raspberry Pi. And you'll also find our kernel sources. So if you wish to modify, we ship with a very uh, a standard, a very stable standard Linux kernel that we are that we're very happy with. Uh, if you do want to change our kernel, uh, then you can go and um, download both the tool chain, which you'll need to build the kernel, and you can download our kernel sources and everything we have. You can build for yourself at home. So there's one final topic that I'd like to cover. Um, this is what we call the configuration file. Um, now, your SD card, uh, when you've either purchased it or um, uh, written to it from your SD card reader, uh, will have two partitions on it. There's one very, there's one very large partition, which has a, um, a there's one very large partition, which has a um, 
which contains the, the root file system image for the device. Um, and there is a much smaller partition which contains both the uh, which is access, which is readable on the PC, um, and which contains both your um, GPU firmware uh, and the uh, Linux kernel image. It also contains a file which we call config. It may contain a file which we call config.txt, and this allows you to control display settings for the analog and digital television output. Uh, and it also allows you to overclock the device. So there is some, you know, many people get in touch with us and say, can you overclock Raspberry Pi? Um, you can overclock Raspberry Pi. There's not an enormous amount of overclocking headroom on the device. Uh, you may find that your device, you may find you get lucky and your device uh, is more overclockable than average. So those facilities are provided here. So what you do is you write uh, a file dot co called config.txt into this smaller fat partition on the SD card. You can either do this from a PC, or you can do it on the device itself. When the device uh, boots, it mounts that partition uh, under forward slash boot in the system. So if you're, uh, if you, once you've boosted, booted your Raspberry Pi, you can type Joe space forward slash boot forward slash config.txt and just start typing, and then type control K X at the end to save, reboot the device, and your new changes will take effect. And there are a large number of options you can place in this file. There is documentation available. I guess common ones, ARM Freak and uh, GPU Freak. Um, I allow you to set the uh, clock frequency for the ARM, which by default is 700 megahertz, and for the GPU, which by default is 250 megahertz. Um, we have a variable called SDTV mode, which allows um, European uh, and uh, North American customers to select uh, their analog output between PAL and NTSC. Um, I believe in reading the documentation, we also support um, uh, Brazilian PAL, which is a variant of PAL um, which uh, has only 525 um, uh, scan lines, and I believe we support Japanese NTSC, uh, which has some uh, uh, some, some other features um, compared to regular NTSC. Uh, we have an equivalent called HDMI mode, which allows you to select the display resolution uh, of the HDMI interface. Typically, if this is missing, then at startup the uh, Raspberry Pi will negotiate the best possible resolution it can with your display. However, you can force it into another mode. Um, and we have a, a series of uh, four parameters called, uh, that begin with overscan, that allow you to set a board around the display. Some displays, particularly analog displays, um, will advertise a, a somewhat higher resolution than they actually support. Um, so when negotiation happens, you'll find the edges of your screen are off the side of the physical, um, the, the edges of the, the desktop or the console are off the side of the physical display. Now, this can be very annoying, particularly off the bottom, because what you'll, what you'll tend to find in console mode is that the line you're currently typing on uh, is off the bottom of the display. So by setting these overscan uh, uh, parameters, you can, take, you can nudge the sides of the display in until they're visible on the screen. Uh, you should note it's extremely easy to break your installation by editing this configuration file. That's why we say it's for advanced users. Uh, the most common way to break this is to try to uh, set a, um, a, an HDMI mode, is to force an HDMI mode that your display doesn't support, uh, in which case your, um, uh, your system will boot headless. It will boot um, without a display. Um, uh, I did this, actually, when I was preparing this presentation. I wanted to select a, a nice low-resolution display. Uh, so that my screenshots, so the text in my screenshots would be very large. So I tried to force my monitor to VGA, and the system booted headless. Um, so I ended up having to type blind. Fortunately, I was able to uh, uh, blindly delete the, con the incorrect config that I'd uh, blindly log in and delete the config and then reboot the machine. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a bit uh, uh, not not a fun experience. Um, of course, you can always go and reflash your SD card, but that's going to uh, waste uh, waste a bit of your time. Typical configuration file on the right-hand side uh, just uses a few of those parameters. So we use STTV mode um, and um, STTV a um, aspect to set both the mode, in this case PAL, uh, and the aspect ratio, in this case uh, 16 to 9. Uh, and we certainly, in this case, we select medium-sized uh, medium borders. OK, so what have we covered today? Uh, we've seen how to set up. Uh, boot and configure your Raspberry Pi. Um, we've seen how to use the built-in text editor to edit uh, programs in a couple of languages, uh, how to run a simple Python script. Uh, we've seen how to use the uh, wget utility to download a, uh, a pack of uh, more complex Python examples, and how to use the tar command to unpack that package. Uh, and we've seen how you can build and run one of the C programs that we bundled with the standard install, which gives you access to some of the multimedia features on the device. 
I guess a couple of uh, a couple of concluding comments. Um, one, remember, Raspberry Pi is just a GNU Linux box. Uh, we're just a regular Linux box. There's an enormous amount of tutorial information, generic, non-Raspberry Pi specific tutorial information online. Um, so we'd very much encourage you to go out uh, once you get your Raspberry Pi, go out and take a look at some of that. There are some fantastic books, some fantastic articles, and some fantastic videos online, uh, most of which are applicable to Raspberry Pi. Um, and finally, don't be afraid to play around with this thing in software. You can certainly break your Raspberry Pi uh, permanently if you uh, um, connect the GPIO connector incorrectly. Um, it's very possible to damage your Raspberry Pi. However, the fantastic thing is from software, it's extremely difficult to do anything more than just um, break your SD card image. So, uh, you know, you are at worst a reflash away uh, from having a fully working Raspberry Pi again. Um, play around in software. Um, uh, you, you're going to learn a hell of a lot more if you're prepared to, uh, if you're prepared to risk uh, having to uh, go back to that slide on, um, on reflashing your SD card. So I think that's it. I think that's all of my material. Uh, I'm aware there are a number of questions waiting for me, so I'm just going to go over to the Q&A window now, uh, and I'm going to try and answer as many of those as I can in the remaining time we have available. Uh, anything I don't get to now, we'll try and uh, we'll try and get some answers for uh, uh, um, up on the uh, up on the webinar site uh, as soon as we possibly can. Okay, let's have a look through some of these. What we've got. Let's try to pick ones that were actually said after the uh, webinar started. Um, let's see. Uh, is this the um, uh, is this an alpha, a beta, or a final board in the image? Uh, hold it up again. Um, hold it up somewhere you can actually see it. Um, this is the final board. Uh, this is a uh, final Chinese manufactured uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, generally, the way you can tell, there are several ways of telling. One, it's definitely not an alpha board, it's too small. Um, two, it's definitely not a beta board because, well, two reasons. One, you may recall some of our, our beta boards tended to have uh, oversized um, SD card connectors on. Uh, this one has a regular size one. We did, in fact, have two whole beta boards that had correct sized. Um, uh, um, uh, correct sized SD card readers, but the real giveaway, yellow RCA jack. Um, all of our other yellow RCA jack and black um, audio jack. Um, our, our prototypes had a black RCA jack and a blue audio jack. Um, another question, what type, what type of HDMI port um, do you use to connect to a PC monitor or, or um, to a PC monitor for a laptop? Um, quite a lot of monitors will have both an HDMI and a DVI port. Uh, the, the port you can't use, you can't use a VGA port. So you can use either an HDMI port uh, directly, uh, or you can use a DVI port with a very cheap adapter that's possible to buy online. Let's see what else. Do the GPIO pins come pre-soldered on the first few batches? Um, yes, they do. Um, I was uh, we got lucky there. Um, I had intended to. Uh, to not do that. Now, one of the interesting things here is you can see on this board most of the components are surface mount, and therefore they can be um, they're, they're soldered without they're soldered by they're installed and soldered by machine. Um, sometimes it's necessary for what we call through hole components, like the um, the RCA jack here. I don't know if you can see, but we have these through hole joints on here. Sometimes those require human intervention, and human intervention obviously costs money. Um, we had it, uh, the um, ignoring the GPIO connector. The device has about 26 um, uh, through-hole joints on it. Uh, the GPIO connector on its on its own has 26 through-hole joints. So we had intended to defeature this from the device in order to save cost. Have we discovered that our manufacturer is able to do these uh, to do this very cheaply, uh, and therefore we have bundled the um, we have uh, pre-sold the GPIO pins on the first few batches. It's possible we may defeature that from future batches, but I'm very hopeful that we can avoid doing that. Ah, here's a, here's a question we get asked asked a lot. Why was the Raspberry Pi upsized? Um, the, the, when we first discussed Raspberry Pi, uh, it was the um, it was the size of a USB stick. Um, the um, the reason why we changed the reason we changed was uh, we we decided that we really needed the extra interfaces. So a lot of people uh, the the USB stick size device um, really only it had one USB port and it had one HDMI port. It didn't have any analog audio or video. 
uh, it didn't have any Ethernet, and it only had one USB, and it, it required a micro a micro SD card. So simply in order to have physical space uh, to fit all of these features onto the device, uh, we ended up upsizing, upsizing, making it this giant credit card size device. Um, you can see actually, um, I guess perhaps this is most obvious from the back of the board, and you may want to go and look at some of the high resolution shots we posted on the web. Um, most of the action in the board is actually in this little area here. It's in an area of the board which is really no larger than the original board. Um, so the, the majority of the area of this board is about giving yourself area to get these various interfaces out. See what else we have. Will I be able to use the GPIO pins in a similar manner to Arduino? Um, yes, absolutely. So we don't have as much I.O. as an Arduino, um, as a typical Arduino. Um, we don't, in particular, we don't have analog input, so we don't have any ADCs. Um, so, so, but people wanting to do low voltage, 1.8 volt digital I.O. should be able to use this device in very much the same manner that you use, you use an Arduino. We think maybe 10% of the things you can do in Arduino, you'd be better off doing on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the thing that really excites us about Arduino, though, is the possibility of connecting an Arduino to this device. At the moment, Arduinos require a host PC. Uh, we very much hope in due course to be able to offer the option to host um, uh, to host Arduino um, uh, from a Raspberry Pi and eliminate that substantial cost. So what else have we got? Will there be other models beyond, besides the initial two models, which will have more powerful hardware, such as increased CPU power, more RAM, more USB ports? Um, I think we've been very careful not to talk about future products. Obviously, you know, for Raspberry Pi as a success, you know, we'd love to go on and do and do more things. We have no plans at the moment, um, and you know, I think we have to be very careful uh, to avoid uh, kind of promising the earth uh, while we're still in the uh, uh, in the business of getting the first Raspberry Pis out the door. Uh, I didn't follow Evan's trip to Wales for the certification, but how did it go? And was a EU or UK certification issued? Uh, well, so my trip to Wales uh, is still ongoing. I'm actually speaking to you from Cardiff. I'd expect to speak to you from Cambridge. I'm still in Cardiff. Uh, uh, yeah, we are. We continue to look at the certification issue, and we hope to have an announcement um, uh, in, in due course, really in, the, in quite in, in, in the near future. Let's see what else we've got. Um, oh, somebody's just said, should I be learning Python version 2 or Python version 3? Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, the the Python we bundle on there is, I believe, Python 2.7. Um, I like Python 2.7 because the Hello World program is print Hello World. Uh, it doesn't have any brackets in it. Um, obviously, Python 3 is the future, um, uh, but there's a vast amount of Python 2 software out there, and I think that Python 2 does have some things that make it very suitable as a, as a teaching language. Um, so uh, I don't think we have a we don't have a formal opinion about this. Uh, you can tell from our name, Raspberry Pi. That Pi in Raspberry Pi it was originally Pi in Python, um, although we obviously misspelled it. Um, so uh, we used to be very pro just using Python. I think we're now much more um, ecumenical about what languages people use. Uh, we get a number of questions on here about uh, high capacity cards um, uh, and, and high class cards. Um, currently Raspberry Pi only, uh, uh, does not work uh, with um, class 10 cards. Um, this is largely an issue to do with um, voltage. People are asking whether we found out what the problem was. Um, the problem is um, to do with um, negotiating uh, more modern cards require um, uh, lower voltage modes, require support for lower voltage modes. Uh, we are fixed, our SD, our SD card uh, interface on the current version of Raspberry Pi is a uh, is a fixed 3.3 volt interface. Um, so most of the cards we use are, are class 4 uh, are class four cards. Um, I think we are looking into what we can do uh, to fix that. There would need to be a hardware modification. Um, so there may, be a, there may well be a future version of Raspberry Pi that adds some of that support. But as I say, we have nothing firm planned at the moment. Uh, we certainly had a lot of success with uh, finding good high-performance non-class 10 cards up as large as 16 gigabytes. Uh, so I have somebody who says, shut up and take my money. 
we will show up and take and uh, and obviously do that as uh, do, do that as soon as soon as we as soon as we possibly can. You know, we're working as hard as we can to get these things out the door. Um, let's see, is there a GCC in the Fedora image by default? Uh, I believe there is a GCC in the Fedora image. There's certainly a GCC in the uh, Debian image, which is what we've been looking at today. Uh, the two main tools we, we bundle, we, we bundle Python and we bundle GCC. What else we've got? Uh, is there any JVM? Uh, do we support Java? Um, we don't uh, bundle Java uh, by default. Uh, we have been able to run both the OpenJDK uh, and the uh, Oracle uh, uh, ARMv6 JDK on the device. Uh, we're certainly looking into our options in terms of being able to bundle one of those. Uh, what's very important to us is that we should be able to bundle a version which supports um, uh, user interface, that supports um, one or more of the various user interface libraries that uh, um, the Java features. Uh, so uh, we may have an announcement about that in the next month or so. Uh, another one. Is there any um, uh, World Wide Web server in the uh, default Raspberry Pi image? No. We, we, so we don't bundle Apache. Uh, we don't bundle Apache or anything in the in the standard version. However, um, I should emphasize we are just a GNU Linux box, and in this case, we are just a Debian. Uh, GNU Linux box, and therefore, you, if you want some, something like that, you can just add, you can just use the built-in package management infrastructure in Debian. So I would suspect that apt-get install Apache might well uh, get you a uh, get you a web server on the device. Certainly, it's been a long time since I have failed to be able to install a package uh, that I've wanted on Raspberry Pi. In fact, I installed a number of packages on there that I'd never used before in order to prepare this presentation. Um, what's the best way to emulate the Raspberry Pi distro image on a Windows machine? Um, I think if you look on the raspberrypi.org website, um, there has been some. Um, uh, uh, there have been a number of people who have been very successful in using QEMU, the emulation package QEMU, um, to to run um, uh, to run the Raspberry Pi um, root FS. Um, it may be necessary, obviously, to run. Um, to run an install of Linux in order to be able to run your QEMU installation, but you can use a tool like VirtualBox to do that. Um, is there a BIOS capability to control the hardware elements on the Pi board? Um, we don't ha really have a BIOS in the in the traditional sense. Uh, we have some code which runs on the um, we have some uh, some some code which runs on the um, uh, um, we have some code which runs on the uh, GPU that manages the boot, and so that's part of what often a BIOS does. Uh, and then we have uh, we have some bits and pieces that run um, in a kernel in userland that provides some of that um, uh, some of that uh, interaction. Uh, let's see what else? Uh, will a light distro like Puppy Linux work with Raspberry Pi? Um, we are working to get the Puppy Linux uh, team uh, a Raspberry Pi. They have been they've been extremely keen to get their hands on a Raspberry Pi. Um, uh, we are, we're looking forward to seeing Puppy Linux on there. Uh, we are, we're big fans of we are big fans of Puppy Linux. So uh, you know, that'll be be fantastic, and obviously a good way, particularly if people want to run headless uh, or who want to run in command line mode, a really good way to get the most out of the memory that's on the device. Uh, what's the quick one? What's the monitor resolution? We support resolutions up to uh, um, 1080, up to broadly the equivalent of 1080, um, and um, uh, refresh rates of up to 60 hertz, uh, which uh, translates into a dot clock of. Um, about 148 megahertz. So any any um, any display mode with a dot clock under 150 megahertz is supported. Um, what about Bluetooth support? If I plug in a Bluetooth dongle, um, we are in the process of building a list of um, uh, of USB dongles of uh, uh, Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi USB dong dongles, uh, which we can uh, uh, which we support. Um, there are obviously some some tight constraints on that. They need to have um, uh, either open drivers, fully open drivers, uh, or they need to have uh, binary uh, drivers for for ARMv6. Uh, but there are some. Uh, there's a list of them already. There's a there's a wiki at the elinux.org uh, website that contains a list of supported devices, uh, and we're working to try and qualify some more to give people a to give people a good choice. Uh, is the I2C driver already implemented? I've read some time ago in the forum that it was missing. Uh, we don't currently have an I2C, an I2C driver. We have an I2C peripheral on the device, 
Um, we, um, uh, we've released documentation uh, for the peripheral. Uh, we're very much hoping that somebody in the community will step up and, uh, will, will step up and uh, help us with this. Uh, somebody asking, what, the, what is the constant for NTSC? I assume what is the, uh, the, what's the value that you put into STTV mode in the config.txt for NTSC? Uh, zero. I think Japanese NTSC is one, and I think Brazilian PAL is three. Um, let's see what else. Uh, what is the default format of the main partition? Um, I believe it's currently, so uh, assuming you mean the, uh, the, the root partition, um, the root, root FS partition, I believe that's currently X3FS. See what else? Any plans to port BBC Basic? Yes. <laughs> we, uh, we plan to have BBC Basic on there. Um, I grew up with BBC Basic. Uh, I, I wouldn't want this device not to have BBC Basic on it. Um, see what else? Uh, does the Debian image ship with Perl? I don't believe so, but again, I think that you're probably only an APT get away from having Perl on the device. Um, let's see what else. Does Farnell have a rep at the factory? If so, can they take a picture showing how many units have been built? Uh, I don't believe there is a Farnell uh, employee uh, on site um, uh, at the factory today. Um, uh, as um, uh, as and when as and when people have gone in the factory, they tend to send us photos. Next time somebody goes in the factory and and uh, sends us some photos, we'll try and put them on the uh, we'll try and put them on the raspberrypi.org website. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, uh, is the web browsing fast enough? I've seen a video on YouTube and it was too slow with the Midori browser. Um, I believe it's a usable uh, it's a usable web browsing experience. Uh, obviously, you don't want to open too many tabs is a uh, can be an issue. Um, uh, because we have a limited amount of memory, uh, with uh, with one or two tabs open, uh, I think it's a um, it's a usable browsing experience um, for all but the most complex websites. Uh, let's see, um, can the GPIOs be used to trigger relays? Um, uh, yes, they can. I probably would be a little reluctant to just wire one straight into a relay. Uh, I might be inclined to put some buffering in between. Uh, relays are nasty, noisy pieces of equipment, and I'm not sure that I would want to connect a wire directly from the uh, um, uh, directly from the core straight into a relay. It might work, um, but uh, worth worth a try. Um, let's see what else is there. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, is it fairly easy to get a graphical interface installed, uh, GNOME or KDE, uh, or does one come installed at all? Uh, yeah, so so we install the uh, we we ship with the LXDE uh, desktop environment. Uh, GNOME and KDE are both quite heavyweight environments, um, and so in, in T56 meg of RAM, you find that the Chrome for the uh, uh, for the for your for your desktop environment is eating a good fraction of the RAM on the device. So we tend to use LXDE. That leaves a reasonable amount of space left over for various other applications, whether those are um, applications like Scratch, educational applications like Scratch, or web browser productivity app, uh, or um, integrated development environment. Um, let's see. Uh, Are the USB ports diode protected? Uh, I would have to go and check. Um, uh, they are certainly pretty. They're certainly pretty robust. I don't believe they are diode protected. I think one of the I think one of the issues there is you tend to introduce a diode's worth of voltage drop into your USB power. So USB power is fed directly through from the US from the micro USB input to the uh, to the USB um, host. Um, sockets, uh, and we didn't want to introduce a diode's worth of voltage drop into that. Uh, given we have five volts coming in, we didn't want to be giving out four and a half volts uh, to our uh, to our peripherals. Let's see, um, I've heard the current ARM Debian is not optimized for Raspberry hardware. Do you have any uh, plan to support the porting? So um, this is a uh, I'm guessing a reference to the fact that um, the uh, the current install is what we call a soft float install. Um, we have a hardware floating point unit in the, in the device, and that is not currently used by the, any of the default packages. Yes, we are working to come up with a solution for that, um, particularly for things like web browsing. It's a significant, uh, there's a significant um, 
uh, um, improvement available for moving to a hard float environment. But typically, what you need to do is your entire operating system needs to be half uh, needs to be hard float aware, uh, and it isn't at the moment. So we are working on that. Um, what else? Uh, uh, is it possible to damage a Raspberry Pi through overclocking? It's not possible to damage a Raspberry Pi through overclocking. It will merely cease to work if you push the clock speed up. Um, uh, there's a separate discussion around overvolting, uh, which we uh, probably need to uh, provide a, uh, um, a more detailed statement about uh, in due course. Um, let's see. Any plan for Windows support? Sadly not, uh, for a variety of reasons. One. Um, uh, current versions of Windows only run on x86 hardware. Uh, I see there's a smiley there on, at the end of the question. Um, uh, modern uh, current versions of Windows only support that. Um, there are ARM versions of uh, Windows coming out. Um, those require generally later versions of ARM that we use. They require Cortex-class ARM processors, which we don't have, um, uh, and there are a variety of other reasons. Uh, so there's no current plan for Windows support either x86 or Windows on ARM. Um, will future versions of Raspberry Pi support power over Ethernet? Um, it's probably the most common feature we don't have that we've been asked for, uh, apart from maybe Wi-Fi. Um, uh, it's fairly straightforward. So I, I think that um, initially it's likely that there will be an ecosystem of third-party add-on boards um, to support this. It is something we'd love to support. Uh, we certainly don't have we certainly don't have enough board area to allocate to it, but we would love to find a way to support it in some slightly more sophisticated way than just integrating the uh, the PoE onto the board. Um, can multiple Pi's be clustered? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they're just they're just PCs. Uh, we don't actually, as it happens, think that multiple Pi's together is a is a good way of getting compute. Um, we, uh, although Raspberry Pi offers a very uh, attractive price point for some compute, um, you probably, if you want to, if you want to try and build yourself a cheap supercomputer, uh, you're better off um, using um, uh, white box x86 hardware than Raspberry Pis. Um, let's see. Would DC battery power be applied via the micro USB connector or other separate terminals exposed on the board? Um, DC battery power would best be applied through the um, uh, through the, the, the five volt input. You really need it to be five volts. Um, we feed this power directly through, with no regulation, to the um, to the USB ports on the device. Um, so if you're going to plug anything into the device, um, uh, it will be exposed to whatever voltage you put in there. Um, uh, we have also have a we have a uh, we have a clamp, uh, we have some fusing and uh, we have some resettable fusing and, and a clamp in there to clamp that value to five to five volts. Well, it's not regulated; it is clamped. Um, what I think you would probably find uh, is that if you if you had a battery if you had a poorly regulated battery pack, you would tend to trip the fuse. You would tend to trigger the clamp, and, and uh, um, the current flowing through the clamp would then uh, tend to trip the fuse on the device. So that's kind of um, building uh, ad hoc cables that connect to that port is not a recommended activity. Um, someone's saying, how well does RISC OS run on, on the Pi? There is a, an effort, uh, as many of you may be aware, there's an effort to port the RISC OS operating system onto the Pi. This is the operating system that ran on the Archimedes. Uh, I've seen it running. It runs extremely well. Um, it's not feature complete yet. Uh, in terms of speed, we believe the Raspberry Pi is approximately twice the speed of the fastest RISC PC that ever shipped. Um, uh, which was an Ionix device uh, towards the end of the, uh, the early part of last decade. Um, so that's the that's the rough performance level. It runs extremely well. Um, yeah. Final question, Ivan. Shall I shall I do shall I do shall I do one more? Just one more, then we wrap. Fantastic. Um, okay. Um, I'll do I'll do a fun one. What are your thoughts on making uh, on no, I'm not going to answer that one, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, somebody says, I'm a complete programming noob. How easy how easy will it be to learn to code with a Pi? Um, I believe it will be quite straightforward. We bundle in an enormous number of tools. Um, 
there's already, even before these things are widely available, there's a vast amount of documentation on the internet, and there are some fantastic community sites. I mean, the community that's building up on Element 14 around the Raspberry Pi is, is, is fantastic. There are other community sites out there. Um, so yeah, we think that it's going to be a, um, it's as, it's as easy as, a, we've achieved our goal. We've made a device which is as easy to learn to program on as a machine from the 1980s, except now we have a lot more community involvement. You know, so there are places you can go for help. But previously, I remember having to use the interlibrary loan system to get my documentation. So um, I think I think you'll I think you'll find that you won't be a programming noob for long. So thanks very much, everyone. That's very much appreciated. Over to you, Mike. Um, I was also dealing with uh, quite a few of the Q and A's. Uh, as you were speaking, and uh, pretty much was typing solidly through, <laughs> throughout your whole uh, throughout your whole presentation there. So um, the reception I think we've had has been amazing. Loads of of great questions. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, that when these devices are in, in everybody's hands who's on this call, we're going to see some really amazing things happen uh, around the world. So I, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, everybody else who has uh, committed to be on this call with us today, thank you very much. Uh, again, I think that demonstrates the popularity of this project and the whole concept uh, behind it. So again, thank you very much. And keep an eye out for, for more design flow uh, uh, webinars like this one coming up. So at uh, just after 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon here in the UK, thank you again and uh, goodbye.